Halls of Montezuma, a Mexican War, designed by Michael Welker and David Fox, published by GMT in 2009. Now, I only got my copy last uh, summer at WBC, a second-hand copy, so um, I have not looked at the game till now. Now, when I went on Consim World and read the messages on the game that came out, um, well, right after the game came out in March of 2009, I think, I noticed a lot of questions about the game. An inordinate amount, in fact, a lot of um, questions. And I was a bit concerned about that. So what I'm going to do is get all the negative comments about this game um, at the beginning of the video, because I don't think this game ever really was given a fair chance. But I'll tell you my experience with it. I started to read the rules myself. Standard GNT um, formatting, very clear, lots of illustrations of play. And uh, I didn't have a problem with the rules at all. So I read them and said, well, okay. Let's uh, check this game out, do a solitaire playing, and see what's, uh, see what's what. Then I realized what the problems were. There's a lot of things just not covered in the rules. A lot of things. Um, for one thing, the turn record had some errors on it. I mean, the turn record, for God's sake. So I took the turn record, um, scanned it, and corrected it. Essentially, the heat turns and the spring and summer turns were mixed up here. Um, that's... Okay, that can happen. It's too bad it did. But it was obvious after playing the game that some very critical proofreading had been missed. Actually, some of the setup is incomplete, which is always a bugger. You're trying to set the game up and uh, you can't because it's just not in the rules. Now, in the designer's defense, they did release a 1.1 version of the rules, and you can download that from the GMT site. Downloading the 1.1 rules is practically essential to playing this game. But the other bad thing about the 1.1 rules is they are strictly formatted in text. They are not in the GMT format. So you're not going to have the nice illustrations and formatting. You will have the red text which shows you the changes or alterations or explanations. So, sorry to say you have to have the 1.1 rules and I wish GMT had formatted them in their standard format. To this day, but here we are, um, uh, April of 2017, these have not been done yet. So um, I'm a little chagrined at that. But that's all the negative. The worst thing about this game are the rules. They are incomplete, and that is very unfortunate. And I think that's what has given this game um, a lot of bad press. And that's a shame, because by the way, this is a very, very good game on the Mexican War. So what I'm going to do now is show you the board, the counters, my usual format, the cards, make some comments. But uh, from the start, uh, let's get the negative out of the way. The rules are not the best if you go with the original. But the, um, the game itself is very well done. Let's take a look. Okay, I'm in the middle here of a fool around game, so uh, this is not the setup. But uh, it'll give you an idea what the map is like. This, of course, is all of Mexico which in those days, the 1840s, included the present states of um, Arizona and New Mexico. So this is all of Mexico here. This is Baja, California. And this main border here is the Rio Grande. This being the present state of Texas. There's San Antonio de Bayar. Mexico City is down here. Where is it? Come on, Mexico City, where are you? There you go. Yeah, Mexico's down here. And, of course, you've got the coastal town of Veracruz up here, right here. Yeah. Um, you've got these uh, leader boxes there. If your sacks get a little bit unwieldy, you can put your extra units here. And, of course, the Americans, us good old gringos, have the uh, same thing up here. You get all the major generals, of course, Taylor, Santa Ana, General Worth, General Kearney. All that kind of thing. The board, um, well, I've seen various comments on it. I like it. It's uh, To me, it gives that period feel. These thick lines are the provinces in Mexico, or states, and these little boxes around here give critical information on the state. For example, there's Durango, and on the chart here, you have the number of cities or spaces you need to require to uh, control it. These little markers here with the Mexican flag are, of course, control markers. You flip them to show 
if the Americans capture the state. You've got a little marker showing whether the state is in revolt or not, or calm. And, um, well, that's the map. You've got fortresses, of course, a few of them, not too many, Mexico and uh, Veracruz here. Symbols here, the little we, um, ships indicate ports where American amphibious forces can land. And I'll take a closer look at the map, too, with the close-up lens here, so you can see it a little bit closer. But these little wee spaces with tomahawks are Indian raid um, origin spaces kind of thing. And you've got the Baja California off-board uh, box, and Alta California, which is the rest of California. And you've got the Yucatan down here, too, as an off-board box. So there's a mine of information on the map, and uh, it's quite well done. Let's take a closer look, though. Okay, there's a little bit closer look at the map. We're looking there at the province of Durango. There's that number I was telling you about, the calm or revolt state, and, of course, the control markers. Same for the other uh, states or provinces. Of course, the connect lines, usually one movement point here. These are a little bit rougher terrain. Um, those are two movement points to transit. And, of course, you've got the Rio Grande there. There's San Antonio de Bayar. Goliad, which figured in the Alamo campaign back in 1836. There's Gonzales, and the way up there is Houston. And New Orleans, we're looking at it upside down, is an off-board box. So, uh, you can see that the map is perfectly functional. There's a close-up of what the uh, leader boxes look like. And uh, let's show you some counters. Okay, there's some typical Mexican counters. That's an army uh, unit. When you put units together in an army, the, um, there are certain advantages to having armies. Um, they're minus one in movement when you create an army, but they have plus three in firepower. There's some typical Mexican infantry units. There's the Zapadores engineer unit. There's Artori, these are Dagoons, and your baggage train. Most of the combat counters are double-sided. So when you take losses, you can flip them like many other GMT games. And these can be replenished through the replacement rules, etc. Here's some typical U.S. units. General Kearney, Patterson, Missouri Volunteer Artori, 7th Infantry, and, by the way, these red ones are mainly um, volunteers and 2nd uh, Dragoons. Again, double-sided. Now, the game is divided virtually into two sections. There's the pre-war phase, kind of reminiscent of my Mr. Madison's War. There's a whole game prior to the American Declaration of War and then after. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'll show you with the decks. Okay, the main event decks are divided in two. Prior to the declaration of war, you'll be using this crisis deck. And each card is labeled in the upper right, clearly showing it's part of the crisis deck. So when you sort your game, you divide the decks into two. Crisis deck, and then after war is declared, you'll be adding these other cards that don't say crisis on them to it. So you can have one big deck after war is declared. And of course the crisis events uh, show, uh, reflect more historically what happened prior to the declaration of war. The um, Mexican War is a controversial one. It was not a really popular war in one sense and in another sense it was. But the American desire for war kind of winged after a while. Many of the famous commanders uh, in it were not really for it. There was a young lieutenant uh, Ulysses S. Grant in the war, Robert E. Lee was there, Beauregard, uh, Pickett, you name them. Uh, all these guys were later famous in the Civil War. They all got their training here in the Mexican War. Most of them are in the game in one way or another, either by a card or by an actual counter. But uh, you're not going to get Beauregard and Lee and Grant leading armies here. Uh, they were just young officers at the time. There's the uh, Grant card, for example, a response card. Uh, now, the deck has all of the common 
CDG things we've come to expect. In other words, the card can be used for the operations or the straight event. It can also be used as kind of a response card. It'll say right on it. Um, occasionally, a card will have this little wee wagon train symbol, which means you've got to trigger a supply event on the table. And that's kind of neat, by the way. It's, it's kind of neat. Because most games have a certain supply phase and a certain part of the turn. You sort of calculate for it, and uh, away you go. But this one can come up by surprise. The card comes up, uh-oh, supply event. And if your men aren't in supply on the board, you could be in big trouble. Now, one of the neatest features of this game is the movement uh, system. I really like it, and I'll try to show you how that works. There is another deck of cards called the Action Deck. And uh, let's see how a general moves first, and you'll see what I mean. Okay, the first number on a general is the strategy rating, like in many other CDG games. That's the card that will be needed to activate that general. In Santa Ana's case, a one card will be needed. The middle figure is the number of units that Santa Ana can move. That's also in many games. And, of course, this is his tactical rating. So, let's say, for example, Santa Ana wanted to move. Well, the Mexican player would play at least a one card, and like in many CGGs, the color here indicates who can use it for the event. In this case, it's got the green and the blue. Either side can use it for the event. But in this case, Santa Ana will want to use it to activate him. But, unlike many other games, there's another step involved. Usually, you just play this card, and off you go, Santa Ana. But not in this game. There's another step, and I really, really like it. When you activate Santa Ana, you then draw from this action deck. You flip it over, then you take Santa Ana's strategic rating, which is 1. Look on 1 here, and move down. That's the number of movement points he has. Movement allowance, 7. That's kind of neat, because these movement allowance can uh, vary greatly. Let's pretend it was another turn, Santa Ana moves, he wants to move, you look at his strategy rating one, he also gets a seven. So, this isn't too illustrative. Another seven, maybe I need a good shuffling of his deck. Um, now there we go. There's a one, move allowance zero. So you might activate the general, but you do not know how far he's going to move, or how many movement points he has. Now that's critical. Why? Well, not only for distance, but also combat is a function of how many um, movement points you have. And I'll try to show you that. Okay, I'm just going to show you a short move here to show you how many steps are involved in order to activate a general. Let's say Santa Ana here at El Alamo wanted to attack Taylor here at Paras. All right, well, we know that strategy um, Santa Ana has to pay a strategy card of one, which he does. He then has to consult the action deck again, which he does. He flips it over, and once again, we get seven movement points. So Santa Ana has no problem in going here, because it costs one to go in, and he has six movement points left. Where it matters, though, is if he had got a smaller number. Let's get a smaller number here, four. Okay, let's say he had drawn that as his movement allowance, four movement points. So one to get into the square. Then he's got to check this little table here because the amount of movement points you have left affects the level of battle. Again, a really cool battle mechanic. So he's got three movement points left. These are the costs. You see? Movement point costs. Column of root. It doesn't cost anything, but you can't uh, commit any units. If you do a hasty attack, it costs you one movement point, and um, it's required if you're intercepted. A normal attack, you'd have to have two movement points left. Then you could do a normal attack. But to do a pitched battle, you'd have to have three movement points left, and you get to add one in the post-battle movement. So, depending on how many movement points you have or don't have, will affect the level of the battle. And that's really cool. I really like that mechanism. Now, there's a lot I, I could say about this game. There, there really is a lot to this game. Even the very act of movement is very interesting because we are trying to simulate, or the designers are trying to simulate, the movement of Napoleonic type armies in Mexico. And in summer, that is a rough proposition. So that there's certain turns designated as heat turns. 
just summers mainly. And those turns are particularly brutal to move. When you move in summer, your force automatically loses one step. So you've got to watch your step losses. So we've got an army here, let's say, Santa Ana. He decides to move up to Para, we'll say. And it's summer, one step loss automatic. So it's going to be expensive to move your troops in summer. On top of that, there's all kinds of other effects for moving. Let's take a look at those. Okay, there are the rules are some of the things that affect movement during the heat turn, as I've explained. And it says you, uh, using an underlined movement allowance on the action card. Remember that beautiful action card I told you about? Well, there we go. So there's an underline three. So if a general has a strategic rating of two, got a moving allowance of three, but underlined, he'd have to lose another step. And if he did that in a heat turn, he'd have to lose two steps. So um, there's a lot of effects. Some strategy cards have penalties by playing them for movement. When you activate an out of supply space, there's an effect. And if a state is in revolt, there's an effect. So this is really cool because, um, again, let's say you're in the state of Z Zacatecas, hope I'm saying that right, and you wanted to move, there'll be a penalty for the Mexicans because he's moving in a state that is in revolt. He's also out of supply because it's assumed the state in revolt affects your supply line. And um, if, if you're in a transit space and you fail the transit space die roll, um, that's another effect. There's a die roll effect and uh, maybe you won't move at all. Um, well, I should say you'll take more attrition because when I didn't explain about these transit spaces, the main spaces are these circular ones right here. These are the ones you can control. These are called just transit spaces. But when you move, you have to roll a die for the number of transit spaces you've gone through. So let's say you go through two transit spaces, you're going to roll a die, and I think if you get, um, yeah. The number of transit spaces moved from, through, or into the activated force takes move and attrition. So if this fellow rolled a one or two in this case, he'd take attrition again. So you can imagine what could happen. Let's say you're moving a force in a rebellious state in summer, and you're going through a transit box. Man, it's going to be expensive. So one of the great things about this game is the movement. It's very, very well done. I think that's a key aspect of the game, uh, the movement system. Very well done indeed. Okay, combat occurs when you get in the same space, like many other CDG games. But the designers have got a whole neat little wee mini battle board procedure, which is really cool. Now, the Mexicans have one here, and of course the Americans have one over there, upside down. Now, we'll just follow how you set up the Mexican uh, combat so you'll understand how it works. And I think it's really well done. Okay, for the sake of argument, let's say that that was Santa Ana's force. So what he does first is he picks his lead unit, which will be at full firepower. So I'll pick this, um, oh, let's say these, um, the sixth unit here. Would that be the best? Yeah, might as well. So that'll be the lead unit. It says full firepower. Now because Santa Ana has two stars, He's allowed to pick two committed units, so he picks two, and these are times two firepower. So of course it would be nice to put your higher numbers in here. So we put the grenadiers in here, and uh, it doesn't really make, make any difference here. He'll put the second dragoons. Then it says here all other units one f uh, firepower point each. Okay, now let's show you how they calculate firepower and how the table works. This is really cool. Now at first I was a little bit overwhelmed by the combat because there's so many steps involved. When you have to explain it, it sounds very convoluted, but it actually is pretty simple. It's, um, it's just neat. Um, I really like it. Anyway, uh, anyway, let's get the firepowers uh, calculated. So that was one, and these guys are doubled. So 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 is the base firepower. So the Mexicans would basically be looking on this column here. Okay, well, what's really neat again is before the combat, you're going to roll two dice to see how efficient the army is. 
And there's a whole host of modifiers here which are going to change the firepower. And these are neat. Now, I might make a mistake here, but let's, for this example, see what um, modifiers would be in play. Now, the value of the lead unit, uh, we've got that. Okay, double value of the committed units, we've got that. Each additional unit, we've got that. Combined arms, because the Mexicans are using all three arms, artillery, dragoons, and infantry, they're going to get another plus one to the firepower. Uh, if they have an army, they do not in this case, it's just a force. And any battle cards, for our example, we won't uh, use one. Plus the field commander, only for the U.S. So basically the Mexicans are going to be on the 14 table. And I saw at least one comment on, I think it was ConSim or Board Game Geek. Uh, one fellow was saying, well, good grief, what difference does one firepower make? Uh, hey, guy, I tell you, <laughs> change this one column and... Um, it can change, believe me. So one firepower, it doesn't sound like a big deal. It can be. But basically what you do then is roll your two dice and let's see what happens. Okay, Santa Ana rolls a five, which over here is actually poor efficiency. So he slides over five up to the 14 and he inflicts two movement steps on the Americans. And of course, Taylor would do the same thing. He would add up his forces find out his modifiers, roll the dice, and this would show how many he inflicts on the Mexican. And by the way, when you commit units, the lead units is, al is uh, always loses a step. That's equal to both sides. Each side must do that. And again, I'm showing you a simplified uh, version of the combat. That's generally how it works. It's uh, rather involved, but it's a lot of fun. Now, there's way more to this... Um, game that I'm showing in the video. For example, the, the battle procedure is more or less like 10 steps. I didn't get into the um, retreat before combat stat, the post-battle losses, uh, retreat priorities. There's just a lot more to this game that I can possibly show. You've got naval movement, where the um, Americans can more or less move from port to port. You've got squadrons that will affect the uh, Mexican uh, political will and, and uh, collapse. By the way, I didn't mention the political will counter, and that's rather important. The political will for the uh, Mexicans starts at 30. And the whole objective of the Americans is to get that political will down to zero. You get it down to zero, Mexican government more or less implodes, and you win the game. There are sudden death victory conditions, too, which can um, certainly affect the game. One of them is um, the Mexicans invading Texas. If they get four spaces controlled of uh, Texas, they can uh, get an instant win, so they, uh, Americans have to be careful of that. They just can't go gung-ho into Mexico and ignore Texas. Um, government status, end of turn phase, war declaration, revolts. The revolts are really cool. I won't get into that, but, oh man, they're, they're neat. They're chaotic. As, as states go into uh, rebellion, Mexicans have to put them down and try to protect against Americans. It's a um, cat and mouse chase game sometimes. It's um, a really good game. Um, I'm going to say about the counters. Well, they're the typical GMT quality. I like the way the forts and fortifications work. You actually draw, you, you build a fort, you draw a random one, and you don't know how good the fort's going to be. At least your enemy won't know anyway. On one side is a question mark, and the other side is the actual value of the fortification, which ranges from like plus one to plus three. That's kind of neat. And there's um, forts, almost like in Wilderness War. You kind of um, spend a card to build them, but the little rebuild symbol later on, they're built, and again, you're not really clear on the how well the fortification ends up. There's just so much more to this game that I can possibly show in a short video. Um, I just thought the uh, game deserved more. Now, I'm not defending the uh, original rules book. It was incomplete, and I think that's not a good thing, to say the least. And I do not blame GMT for that kind of thing. GMT is the publisher. I think it's the onus of the designers to produce a booklet that is complete. Now, I've worked with GMT they send you proofs of everything and you have final say. And if there's any errors in my game, I take responsibility for it. I'm the designer. Some things can leak through just through that's the way things are in the publishing industry. But this is a good game. I don't think if you get the 
version 1.1 rules, uh, you'll be okay. I'm a little chagrined that the game is not very well supported. Um, I tried to uh, upload some charts onto Board Game Geek, uh, charts like the corrected turn record track, and uh, I was blocked. Not by Board Game Geek, they say it's the designers, or GMT, I know somebody's blocking, so you can't um, really add any more player aids to the game, at least not in Board Game Geek. Um, I don't know if that's the final decisions of the designers or GMT. I don't know the politics of it all. Just know I, you, you can't do it. And game support for this game has not been too well. I see that there isn't a lot of traffic on the Consum site now. Maybe this game is totally forgotten. I, I don't know. Um, all I can say is um, the reason I did the video is because it's a, a good game. This is a very good game on the Mexican War. I know I think it suffered a little bit from uh, the first edition of the rules, but uh, that's a shame. Anyway, uh, that's it for uh, the Mexican War. Halls of Montezuma. I think this is a pretty good game. Thank you for watching.